Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you here, and uh, it's good to have all of you with us online. We welcome you to the last part of our quest for uh, quest for peace series. It's not the end of our quest for peace, but it's the end of the series. And uh, I have to tell you that I have really been helped by this series. I realized whenever all this COVID stuff hit and kind of everything came to a standstill for a little while, how much I needed the rest and how much I needed peace in my life. Uh, Did you know that you can be a Christian for a long time? You can be in ministry and still need things that God has to offer you. And that is the way, that's the way it works. Nothing to be ashamed of. Um, And so uh, I have really gained a lot from this series. Uh, the first week, we talked about anxiety. And then the second week, we talked about calamity. Lene talked to, she spoke that week, and she talked about peace in the middle of the storm. And then we talked about clarity, and we talked about order last week. And this week, we are talking about something that we have to talk about in this series. All the other things, it's not likely, but could possibly Uh, take place without interaction with other people. But we interact with a lot of people. We have a lot of relationships in our lives, right? And so today we're talking about peace in our relationships, and I've titled this message, Harmony. Harmony. Could anybody use any harmony in your relationships? Can anybody use just a little bit more harmony in some of the people that you deal with? That's what we're going to talk about today. So harmony, we're not talking about music. We're talking about peace with others, harmony with others, peace with others. And the thing that I want you to know is that the Holy Spirit makes peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said. Blessed are the peacemakers. And the Holy Spirit, when he comes into our lives, he begins to make peace. And you might, you might say, well... I have been operating out of the Holy Spirit for many years, maybe decades you've, been, you've known Christ and you have, have operated from the power of the Holy Spirit, active in certain areas of your life. And maybe you are saying, well, well I, I still don't have peace with, there are a lot of people I don't have peace with. Well, good news, this message is for you today if that is the case. And I'll, t- I'll just say this right off the bat, uh, that if you have major, major relationship issues, we have some great thing that we do here at the net called Celebrate Recovery, and we are starting that back tonight at 6 o'clock, <laughs> Celebrate Recovery. And, uh, and so if, if, uh, if, if you're in a position where you, you're just, man, your relationships are just a wreck in your life around those relationships, it's just a wreck, come to Celebrate Recovery, 6 o'clock tonight. No food tonight, sorry, but we're starting off with no food, Celebrate Recovery. But we have some exciting things happening. We have some brand new worship leaders who are coming uh, to take over the, the worship leadership at Celebrate Recovery, and it is uh, Claire Carpenter and her husband, uh, Ty. So uh, that's exciting, and uh, I'm going to be here tonight just to, just to hear them. It's going to be awesome to get started back tonight, Celebrate Recovery. So the Holy Spirit makes peace. The Holy Spirit is a peacemaker. The Holy Spirit is a peacemaker. And uh, if you find yourself having problems with other people, you might be the problem. You might be the problem. I know this comes as a surprise to a lot of people, but you might actually be the problem. Um, Scripture says in Proverbs, says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even, God, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's pretty awesome to think about. When your ways please the Lord, he will cause even your enemies to be at peace with you. Now, if he will cause your enemies to be at peace with you, what will he do for your friends, for your family, for the people that actually love you and the people that you love? What would he do uh, for our relationships with our neighbors and our coworkers if he'll make our enemies be at peace? Now, I'm not saying that 
he's going to turn your enemies into your best friends. Sometimes he will. But I am saying that God has a way that is the way of peace. It's an awesome thing. So, something to consider. Today is the day of Pentecost. And it's so fitting for this particular message because without the Holy Spirit, we would, ha- would not even have access to the power of peace in our lives. So today is the day of Pentecost. Now, you may be familiar with the day of Pentecost. Jesus spent the, uh, the 40 days following his resurrection. He spent those with his disciples. And then he told them, he said, go into the city and wait. He said, because you are going to receive power. And when you receive the power, it's going to be the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what they did. And so 50 days after the Passover feast, 50 days after Jesus was uh, was arrested and crucified and was resurrected from the dead, came Pentecost. And on Pentecost, God performed a miracle. It was a sign, and it was a miracle, and it was the beginning of something. Two things happened that day that were very miraculous. The first thing was that everyone spoke the word of God. Everyone was speaking Now, they were actually speaking a different language, and they were all given these words by the Holy Spirit. So they spoke the words of God. Now, that's pretty miraculous in itself, to be able to speak the words of God. The the second part of that miracle was that they were speaking in a different language. It was a miracle of them being able to do something that they had never been able to do before, And that's one of the things that the Holy Spirit does. And I believe that God gave us this sign, this miracle, to mark the beginning of something. uh, Because he wanted us to know what the Holy Spirit can do. He can cause you to be able to do things that you could not previously do. Everyone spoke the word of God and they spoke in a different language. And the second part is everyone understood in their own language. That's pretty miraculous. So you have these... These apostles, disciples of Christ, and they're all speaking in a different language, not their own language, but a different language. And all the other people in the scripture names them, and I can't remember all the places that they were from, Phrygia and others, (laughs) other places. Uh, And they spoke different languages. And and, but the, the the miracle was that everyone heard these people. The, the apostles speak in the words of God in their own language, and they understood. So it was a miracle of understanding. It was a miracle of speaking, and it was a miracle of understanding. They were able to do something that they had never done before, and they were able to understand something they never understood before. So you can say this about the day of Pentecost. This began a new age, a new age. When the people of God would have the power to do the things that they previously could not do and know the things that they previously did not know. Now, some of you are saying, I want some of that. I want to be able to do things that I could not do. I want that kind of power. And I want the kind of power that gives me the knowledge The power to know the things that I did not previously know. Anybody want that kind of... I'm just curious. Anybody? Anybody want? You'll take some? You'll take a little little bit here? I've got... Okay. i got several takers for the Holy Spirit. Now, the next next question is going to be, after you come to that conclusion, I need some of that. Second question is, how do I get some of that? All right. This opens a big can of worms because... People, uh, and I'm not going to name groups of people, but there are a lot of groups of people out there that believe that in order to get the Holy Spirit, you've got to do a bunch of stuff. You've got to pray, and you've got to fast, and you've got to ask, and you've got to get on your face before God. I mean, this is a very strenuous thing that people are saying. You know, you've got to do these things. And after a certain time, then God will perform the same kind of miracle where you speak in tongues, and it just doesn't make any sense to me. 
And the reason it doesn't make any sense is because as far as we have documented, you know, documentation, that was the only time it ever occurred. So, are you, so you see, it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, so, the Holy Spirit, every time God gives someone the Holy Spirit, every time God moves uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit in someone's life, there's no big, huge miracle. That was, that was a marker. That was, that was a sign and a marker. I mean, to say this is a new thing that I'm doing and the church begins today. The mission of the church begins today. And you will be able to do things that you could not do. And you will be able to know things that you could not know. So how, how do you get the Spirit? If, there's not, if you can't count on this miracle that these apostles experienced, how do you get the Holy Spirit? Let's take a look at Acts chapter 5. And if you want to read all of this, you just start in Acts chapter 1 with Jesus and his ascension and just go all the way through. And you'll see uh, Acts chapter 2 whenever they, they, the Holy Spirit was given. And now we're in Acts chapter 5 and Peter is talking to the Pharisees, and they have told him not to preach in the name of Jesus. And this is his reply. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and Savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. And here it is. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. You want the Holy Spirit? Obey God. That's how you get it. I have, I have been saying this since day one of this church. God calls us to do things that are beyond our own natural ability. And I, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an every day, every week, every month, every year thing for me that God always is calling me. And, and it could be any time. He's always calling me to do something that's beyond my ability. And, uh, and whenever I step out to do it, that's when the Holy Spirit meets me. That's when the Holy Spirit will meet you. That's when the Holy Spirit empowers us to do the things that he's called us to do. He doesn't say, I want you to go and uh, do such and such. It's going to require this or that. And then get, he doesn't just give you all of the this or that that you need. Now he's waiting for you to move. And when you move, that's when the power comes. Years ago, I was, in, uh, I was at a camp, a summer camp, and I was leading. And so this pastor had given this message. And so at the end of his message, he got really inspired at the end of his message. And he had no idea what he was asking. But he asked me, he said, I'm going to ask Rob to come and uh, play a song for you that encapsulates everything that I have talked about today. And I'm, I'm thinking, maybe we should have talked about this before so that maybe I would have a song in mind, you know? Or if you have a song in mind, maybe you should just reveal that information to me and then maybe I could, if I know it, I can play it. But I had no idea. I had, I, so I got up and I'm whispering to myself, Lord, um, okay, I'm, I'm ready. I'm here. I got up. I got my guitar. I put the strap around my neck. And I'm there standing up in front of everybody. I reached in my pocket. And I pulled out my pick. And I'm ready to strum the first chord. And I strum the first chord. And then there it was. The song. The perfect song that embodied everything that the man was talking about. 
poor guy, he didn't know what he was asking. I guess he just thought the musicians are miraculous, miracle-working people, and they could just do anything at any time. And uh, I was just going to pull some song out of heaven that was going to be perfect for his sermon. And that's exactly what I did. Okay, let's hear it from musicians. It's, it was the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm just teasing. It was the Holy Spirit. And so afterwards, people came up to me, and they were just thinking I was so great. Rob, that song was incredible. It just, it just every, every part of the message, it just embodied the whole message. And the, the man came up to me, and he said, how did you know what song to play? And I thought, that would have been a good question for you to ask yourself before you said it. But, but I said, I gave him the, you know, the, the answer that we always give. Oh, it was just God. It was just God. It wasn't me. But it really was. It was just God. And that's the way this thing works. It works whenever we get up and we put our hand to whatever it is that God has called us to do. That's the connection. That's when the power comes. And boy, does it come. God will not leave you hanging. So, with relationships, we need, we need the power of the Holy Spirit because we cannot do, we do not have the power to do the things that cause us to have great relationships and peace, mainly, peace in our relationships. There's a scripture, Apostle Paul in Romans 12, he says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. That's a tall order. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, that's your part, if it's possible, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And I've heard this preached a hundred different ways, the heap burning coals on their head. But... Have you ever been embarrassed? Have you ever been ashamed of yourself? You know how that your face feels when you get that way? Sometimes it turns red, but it feels hot. I've experienced that many times, unfortunately, many times in my life. I have said things, and I get so embarrassed because I said the wrong thing. And, and what happens is whenever you do good to those who are doing evil toward you, it makes them ashamed. It's a natural human emotion. It causes them to be ashamed of, of doing evil to someone who is doing good to you. And if you introduce evil into a situation where there is already evil, if you repay evil for evil, what does that do? It just creates more evil. It's just evil everywhere. But he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you have a hope of overcoming evil, it will be overcoming evil with good. If, if you have a situation with a family member, do your best. Or if you have a situation with your coworker or your neighbor or your friend, do your best as much as you can do to make peace with that person. If it means apologizing and, and, and they need to apologize and you need to apologize, just do your part. Just do, do, make your apology. You know, Don't wait for them. To, I'll apologize if they apologize. Well, you're going to be waiting a while, probably. So, so anyway, as much as you can do on your side, make it happen on your side. Um, so last week, um, Lene, I didn't ask your permission to tell, tell the story, but I'm going to. And this makes her very nervous when I say this. <laughs> but anyway, last week, Lene was reading. She was reading Scripture as she always does. She, she reads and prays way more than I do. And 
every morning she's up with her Bible and her coffee and her, she's praying and, and she, she always has something to share with me, always has something to tell me. And so this particular day, she came to me and she said, hey, I need you to help me with something. And I said, okay. She said, uh, there are some people, some people, who have done things in the past, and I have, I thought I was over it, and I forgave the person. It's not, it's not that I didn't forgive the person, but, um, but I remember the things that the person did. I remember the person, what they did, and sometimes I just remember it, and I start getting angry about it again. And I said, who are you talking about? And she said, well, I didn't want to say, but it's you. And I said, okay. Um, and I didn't get angry because I know this about her. She has a memory like a steel trap. She never forgets anything. And I love that whenever I'm trying to remember something. But I have no recollection of most of the terrible things that I've done in this world. Um, but but she, was, she was saying, you know, I, I, she said, I've forgiven you. I love you. I, you know, but, but sometimes I think about that time, that Christmas, whenever you said such and such. And I'm like, what? Christmas? I, 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 you know, I'm at a loss. But, but she, she remembers that she was having a problem with this. And she said, I really just need your help. Is, can, is there anything that you can say to me? And so I... No sooner had I even turned my attention to God, but I had these words on my lips, and I spoke it out, and you can testify, it was so quick. I said, let the wheat grow up with the tares. I didn't even know what the heck I was talking about. I really didn't. I had no idea what I was talking about. I said, let the wheat grow up with the tares. And she sat there for just a second. She says, oh, I get it. And I was thinking, well, if, if you get it, maybe you could explain it to me. Because I, st- I didn't know what I was talking about. I said, so I hadn't read the scripture in probably a year or two. I can't remember the last time I read the scripture. I said, let the wheat grow up with the tares. And then I started expounding on that. I said, so there are, there are weeds that grow up and, and you're not qualified to go and get to weed out the weeds from the, what God is doing. So just, why don't you just leave it to God? And she was just, she was just blown away. She was just saying, oh my gosh, this is exactly, this is bringing me peace and freedom and, and setting me free from this. It's so good. So I went and looked up the passage of Scripture, and I'm going to share it with you this morning. This is in Matthew, and this is Jesus. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Okay? Next. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The good stuff was coming up. There was some good stuff there, but the bad stuff was also showing up. The weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy, he says, did this. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, no, he says. Because while you are pulling up the weeds... You may uproot the wheat with them. See, we are not qualified to go and root out the evil in everybody's life. Because whenever we try to do it, whenever we put ourselves in the position of judge, whenever we do the opposite of what Jesus was saying, first take the speck out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to... Take the speck out of your brother's eye. He actually said log. Take the log out of your eye. When we do the opposite of that and we're trying to correct everybody else, we just mess it up. Almost 100% of the time, we mess it up. Have you ever messed it up? I have messed it up. 
I know what it's like. And he says, no, because while you are pulling up the bad stuff, you might pull up the good stuff too. So leave it alone. He said, let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. This is the wise man, the wise master. This is God. So the disciples came to him later and they said, Explain this parable to us. We don't understand it. What, what do you mean? And Jesus said, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The God of creation. God Almighty. The Christ. The Savior. Our refuge. That is who sowed the good seed. The Son of Man who came into the world to bring good news. To set the captives free. And, and all of this good seed is coming up in the world. Good, good stuff. Some of it is coming up in you. Some of it is coming up in me. But at the same time that the good stuff is coming up in us, there's a contrast, isn't there? If it was just a, a field full of weeds, there would be no contrast. But because there's good stuff, the weeds begin to show. The weeds begin to show. And he says, the field is the world. This is where we live. The good seed stands for the people, and we are the seeds. Good things come out of us. The, the, the field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. Do you know that you have two people living inside you? You do. The Bible says you do. You have uh, the Spirit of God or the man of God, and then you also have the man of sin or the spirit of sin or the carnal mind. The, the Scripture calls it all kinds of things, but it's all the same. There are two people living in you. And hopefully the man of God is the one who is growing and thriving and the man of sin is the one who is withering away. Hopefully that is happening. The weeds are the people of the evil one. As the seeds are pulled, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. At the end of your age, at the end of my age, at the end of everybody's age. It says, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out his kingdom. Everything that causes sin, everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. He says, they will throw them into the blazing furnace where, they, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I've told you this many times. If God is working in your life, there's going to be some pain. You don't cut away the flesh without there being some pain. You don't deal with your sin nature. God does not pull the sin nature out of you without there being any pain. There is pain in Christianity. And it's a good thing. Uh, scripture you know, compares it to childbirth. It hurts for a little while, right? And then it's good. I've got three boys right here, and it, and it, was, it hurt Lene. <laughs> kind of hurt me, too, just to see her in pain. But it, you know, it resulted in life. It resulted in great stuff. So the pain is there. He said, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous, then the righteous, that's you and me, when we have been weeded, when we have been weeded out, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. If you have wisdom enough to hear this message, then hear it and act on it. This is the message. Let the wheat grow up with the tares. You want to correct your spouse? You want to change them? 
You want to make them into, what, into the image of what you think they ought to be? Give it up. You want to change your friends and your family and your coworkers. You want They're just not the way you think they ought to be, and you want to change them. I'll tell you, the best thing that you, you, you can possibly do is to be Christ-like. To let Christ abound in your life. To love them. Love them. Forgive them. Lavish them with love and forgiveness. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. Be patient. And when they see you and the power that's working in your life and that you don't hold things against them because they have sinned against you, it might just have an effect on them. The Apostle Paul held the jackets, the coats of the people who stoned the first martyr, Stephen. Paul didn't know it, but Stephen was his brother. He was his brother in Christ, and Paul did not even know it. And Paul held their jackets so they wouldn't get blood and sweat and stains on their Jacket, And he held their garments, and he consented to the murder of Stephen. And what did Stephen do? He said, Father, do not hold this sin against them. And he forgave them. While they were killing him, he forgave them. And the Apostle Paul, I read a quote this week, I wish I could remember it. But the Apostle Paul who gave us the New Testament, who gave us, who gave us grace, who gave us the revelation of grace and, the, and, and so much revelation concerning Christ and his people. He was affected by the shame that, that, that came from killing an innocent person Someone who, at the very time, was forgiving him. It's a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. So what do we do? We have to take our hands off of our own souls. We have to take our hands off of our own minds. We have to stop trying to create ourselves into some image that we have in mind for us because we want to be this or we want to be that. We need to take our hands off of ourselves. This is something great that the Holy Spirit does. He refocuses us. He takes our focus off of the inward part of us. And he, he, he focuses us outward. And, and so he focuses us on, on, the, on the Spirit of Christ, the, the God, the Father that we worship... And he focuses us on other people. And when we loosen our grip on our own souls, on our own minds, on our own hearts, when we, when we let go of that and begin to do the work of Christ out here, something incredible happens. God's Spirit comes in here. And he begins to mold us into his image. And I, I believe this, that you have to let go of your own ways and your own preconceived ideas in order for God to change you. Let him have your heart. Surrender yourself to him. Let him have his way. Let God change your heart and the Holy Spirit will make peace in your relationships. I'm not saying it will all be perfect, but he can bring peace. He may not bring peace to the other person, but he'll bring peace to your heart. It's true. And if you are overwhelmed by all this, you can come to Celebrate Recovery and get involved at 6 o'clock tonight.